Bifocal, Chapter 4, Haroon My father is making his famous lamb casserole for supper. It's famous in his own mind, but in no one else's. I hope you worked up an appetite, he says when I walk in. Then he looks up at the clock. You're early. Did you get expelled? He makes jokes like that because he knows that getting expelled or even suspended is the least likely thing to happen to me. My father doesn't listen to the radio except for concerts on the public stations. He says the music helps him concentrate on his writing. He pays as little attention to the modern news as he possibly can. If it didn't happen at least two hundred years ago, he's not interested. He wouldn't have heard anything about my day. No, but I almost got arrested. Did you? he says without looking up. That seems to happen all the time. I'm serious. I almost got arrested. That gets his attention. He nods at the celery on the chopping board. I wash my hands and get busy. It'll probably be on the news tonight, I say, wishing I didn't have to tell him. There were TV cameras there. TV cameras, he repeats. I can't read the expression on his face. It's deeper than the usual parental concern. This was something big then. He keeps his voice calm, though. I take after him most of the time. I keep my voice calm, too. We were put on lockdown, I say, and then I tell him the whole story, seeing the anger flash on his face when I mention the handcuffs. I get almost to the end when Zanna bounces into the house, her basketball bouncing at the same time. She gets a frown from my father, but it's tempered with a wink and a kiss. She puts the ball down anyways and starts munching on some celery. I've cleaned and chopped. Did he tell you, she asks. You interrupted me, I say. Did he tell you that the kids are saying he turned the other student over to the police so he could take his spot on the reach for the top team? That stops me. My father stops performing his so-called magic with the spices. I don't know what to say. I want to say it's not true, but the idea of defending myself to my family is absurd. Rumors blow over, my father says. I don't think this one will, Zanna says. I try to hand her a knife. If she's going to eat, she can help chop. She ignores it. I might get overshadowed, though. I stopped at Sarah's house to watch the news. They have cable, she adds as a dig at my father. The police arrested 17 people, including Azim. They say they've uncovered a plot to blow up other high schools, government buildings, the subway. This is serious. They're saying he did all these terrible things, that he belongs to an international terror network. He's 17, I say. His poor parents, my father says. He perfects the seasoning and scoops up the celery before Zanna can eat it all. All the families must be so scared. Could they send him to Guantanamo? My head snaps up when I hear Zanna ask that question. My mind sees images of blindfolded men in cages guarded by soldiers. I can't picture Azim there. I refuse to. Azim belongs on the reach for the top team. Until this moment, I haven't really grasped what, what is going on. He's a kid, I say. There are rules and laws, procedures. I took grade. I took law in grade 10. Climb down off your dream clouds, Anna says. Other kids have been sent there. They're still there. She sticks her head in the fridge. My father steers her towards a bowl of apples on the kitchen counter. Lamb casserole? She turns to me and makes a face. Your turn to pay for pizza. Dad acts offended, but we know he's not. He grabs us and holds us close. I know he's thinking about the parents who cannot hold their children today who cannot present them with plates of food and watch them eat and argue and laugh. I know he's thinking that, because I'm thinking the same thing, and so is Anna. Later, we manage to eat the lamb casserole without kneeling over. Dad puts a portion away for Mom when she gets home from the hospital. She specializes in high-risk pregnancy, so her schedule isn't regular. If there is a new mother in trouble, she hates to leave at the end of her shift. Dad's hours at the university are more regular. All through dinner, Zanna talks about the arrest. How will you defend yourself, she asked me. Defend myself against what? Against that rumor. Kids will want to know why they let you go. Don't defend yourself, Dad says. Only a fool defends himself against foolishness. Is that a quote from Dickens? I help myself to more casserole. It's not half bad this time. It's a quote from me, Dad says. You're in high school, a hotbed of hormonal drama. By tomorrow, it'll be forgotten. Zanna starts to argue, but she is easily distracted by a discussion over whose turn it is to do the dishes. It's hers, which she knows full well, but she argues the point anyways to see if she can wear me down. She can't. Not tonight. Later we watch the local news on one of the two television channels we can get without cable. The arrests take up most of the broadcast. Police Chief Timothy Brown's face fills the screen, talking about the extraordinary cooperation between many agencies in thwarting this terrible threat to our way of life. 
I want to assure the public that safety is of the utmost importance in all our minds. It's important that we go about our daily lives as usual. To do otherwise would let the terrorists win. But we welcome the public's cooperation in reporting anything suspicious to the police. Live your life but watch your neighbors, says Zana. What's suspicious? Muslims? We're suspicious. Islamic terrorists, they said. The men who blew up that building in Oklahoma City were Christians, but no one called them Christian terrorists. Quiet, I say. Zana tosses the cushion at my head, but stops talking for now. The police chief is saying that these arrests in no way reflect badly on the Islamic community as a whole. The camera pulls back and shows him shaking hands with a group of Islamic leaders. There's our imam, I say. One by one, the leaders call for peace and reason. They couldn't find one woman, Zana grumbles. All the leaders standing with the chief are men. Go down there and tell them off, I say. Give us some peace. I knock her feet off the footstool to make room for my own. In the last few months, my feet and arms and torso have finally caught up with each other. For the longest time, I was tripping over rugs and knocking over lamps because I was growing so quickly and it seemed unevenly. Even though I'm finally taller than Zana, she can still beat me in basketball. You don't care about anything as long as you have your quiet little life, she says, snatching the footstool back. I let her have it. We're getting too big to wrestle. Besides, she's better coordinated than I. I don't get much of a chance for a quiet life with you around, I say. Well, I don't like quiet. I like action, Zana says, jumping around in her chair. Zana rarely keeps still. Go blow something up, then, I say. Go form the Islamic Women's Liberation Front. Blow up symbols of oppression and leave me alone. The first thing we'll blow up is you, Zana says. It's a normal exchange for us, done without rancor. No one is blowing anyone up, our father says automatically. His attention is divided by, old, by the old English law book he's reading. Zana won't let it go. I wonder what they're saying about you in the chat room. About me? Our father raises his head, perplexed. About Haroon. Dad goes back to his book. I'm sure they're saying he's a handsome boy who does his turn at the dishes without arguing. Zana tosses a cushion at his head in response. Dad laughs and tosses it back. The story winds down with more footage of our school. The very last shot is of the police officer shaking hands with me and smiling. Zana shuts off the TV. She has to do it manually because we don't have a remote. Then she turns and hovers over me with her hands on her hips. You shook their hands? They just hauled a Muslim kid off to jail and you shake their hands? It was one hand, and I didn't shake his. He shook mine. I didn't exactly have a choice. I try to push her away, but she's like a vulture waiting for something to die. Didn't have a choice? You couldn't put your hands behind your back? It happened so fast, I say, but there's a doubt now in my mind. It makes me feel worse. They had only just uncuffed me, I add, but that sounds like pleading. You know how this looks, don't you? How am I going to explain this to my friends? Zana leaves me and stomps outside. Moments later, I hear the basketball bouncing. She uses basketball to take the edge off her temper. Sometimes it works. I look for help from Dad, some word of reassurance, but he's buried in his book. Oddly, I do find that reassuring. Zana's outburst and my police handshake aren't important enough for him to return to this century. It's a funny feeling having no homework. I sit down at my computer, thinking about what Zana said. Would they be talking about me? I bend down to turn it on. Then I sit up again. I don't really want to know. I picked up the Dickens habit from Dad. The easiest way to make modern problems disappear is to slip into the pages of Oliver Twist or Bleak House. I stretch out on my bed and read. Then I fall asleep with a workhouse full of orphans spread across my chest. I wake up when Mom knocks and comes into my room. She sits down on the side of my bed. Good day, I ask, my head still full of sleep. A good day, she replies. That's sort of a family code that we've developed. A good day means that she didn't lose any of the moms or babies in her care. If it's a bad day, sometimes she doesn't feel like talking about it. It's shorthand. If she comes home in a bad mood, we know why, and give her time to get out of it. What about you, she asks. A strange day, I rub my eyes. I saw the news, and your father called me. Are you all right? It doesn't seem real. Maybe it isn't, she says. Maybe by tomorrow we'll have all blown over. She gives me a kiss and says good night. Just remember that you are an honorable young man and have nothing to be ashamed of. She leaves my room to get her supper. I look at the room I've grown up in. It's nothing fancy. We aren't fancy people. We believe in reading books, serving others, and being together. But the furniture is solid. The rugs and the curtains thick. 
I keep a tidy room because that's how I like it. The few bits of boyhood still here, a shelf model of ships that I built, a few shelves I picked up on our camping trip to Nantucket when I was nine, blended neatly with the dictionary, computer, and the poster of the periodic table. I'm hoping the information on the poster will seep into my brain as I sleep. Chemistry is a struggle. Bits of Afghanistan are here and there, too. Little touches of old family belongings that manage to survive time and distance. I feel rooted in this room, to my family, and to the values that hold us together. Outside my room, I can hear Zana arguing with Mom about some little thing. I can't decipher the words, but I can tell from the tone that it's good-natured argument. Perhaps she's given up her militancy already. Zana gets crazy notions in her head and holds on to them as if they were universal truth. But then another more appealing idea comes along, and she embraces that one just as strongly. We're twins, but we're not very much alike. My room is normal. My mother and my sister having an argument is normal. My father getting lost in his research is normal. My house and my world are solid around me. High school is always crazy, I remind myself. Tomorrow there will be a whole new craziness. I put out my light. I don't remember getting much sleep. There are police cars outside our school again the next morning, although not as many. Just two or three. I ignore them. I'm looking for Julian. He'll have something sane to say about the whole mess. I spy him and Reverend Bob in Brown Town. We didn't give the area that name. The white kids started calling it that and it stuck. Some of us even call it that now, even though it's insulting. Muslims come in all colors, but it's just easier to say, meet you in Brown Town, than meet you on that pass of grass outside the home economics room in the northeast corner of the school. Julian is Jamaican, or his parents are. He was born here. They're all citizens now. He doesn't really belong in Brown Town, but things like that don't bother Julian. Any group of people is an audience. He goes where he wants, and he gets away with it, too. I wave, and he makes Reverend Bob wave back. I start to cross the quad to meet him. It's Haroon, isn't it? A man in a suit comes out of nowhere and stands in front of me. He holds out a police badge. Yes, I say. My name is Haroon. I try to keep walking, but the officer puts his hand on my arm. He doesn't grab it, but I sure know it's there. What's your hurry? School bell won't ring for twenty minutes. He holds out his hand for me to shake. I'm Detective Kenneth Moffat. Just wanted to tell you again how sorry we all are for yesterday. Mistaking you for a terrorist, I mean. Mistakes happen. We hope you won't hold it against us. He is standing close and speaking quietly. I see all sorts of faces turned our way. Someone apologized yesterday, I say. I have to go. You don't mind if we chat for a moment, do you? With his arm around my shoulder... Detective Moffat walks me to the police car at the curb. Another officer is standing by the car and opens the back door. Slide on in there for a moment. We can talk out here, I say, knowing how many eyes are on us. On me. The police are not supposed to question a minor without a parent present. I remember that from law class. I'm about to assert my rights, but then I start to wonder if I'm remembering it correctly. Instead, all I manage is a feeble, I really have nothing to say. Get in the car, Haroon, unless you want us to think you've got something to hide. It doesn't feel like I have a choice. I get in. They close the door. I've never been in the back of a police car before. I look at the door and realize there's no way to get out from the inside. I start to shake. I hope I hide it well. Two cops get onto the front seat, and a third gets into the back with me. They all turn and look at me. For a long time, no one says anything. Then the officer in the driver's seat says to me, It's a heck of a thing we've got here. A heck of a thing, says the man next to him. We're talking about serious threats on lives of a lot of people, Detective Moffat says. Did you ever stop to think about what blowing up a school would do? Not just to our city, but to our whole country, did you? I shake my head. People would become too afraid to let their children go to school. The education system would collapse. The economic fallout would be staggering. An attack on a school is an attack on our entire way of life. Now, just imagine if the subway system or our government buildings were no longer safe either. Imagine what that would do to the economy. Miss Singh would have had a field day with that sort of logic. I imagine her now, leaping around with her quick feet and her quick mind. In my nervousness, I find the image funny, and my lips twitch. I bite them to make them stop. I'm glad that amuses you, the officer in the front passenger seat says. I think he's in on it, he says to the driver. I think we should question him at the station. He switches back to me. You laugh at treason? 
Treason is a word that takes the twitch out of my lips and makes me go cold. It's a word out of history, a word with beheadings. Oh, that may not be the legal definition of treason, he continues, but that's what it amounts to, a traitor to our way of life. Another long silence. I try to pretend I'm James Bond, cool and with a bag of tricks up my sleeve. It's not working. Don't be afraid, Haroon, Detective Moffat says with a quick glare at the cops in the front. We know you weren't involved. You come from a good, respectable family. Father a professor, mother a doctor. Your family has tried hard to fit in, not like some of these others. My brain is racing as fast as my pulse. How do they know about my family? And do they think they compliment me by insulting others? But I'm too scared to defend myself or anybody else. It must have been a shock to see your friend taken away like that, the officer on the other side of me says. Azim's not my friend. We're not even in the same grade, I say. Immediately, I want to snatch the words back. It's true we're not friends, not like me and Julian, but we do the reach for the top thing, and we have fun doing that. I want to explain, but I feel thick and stupid. Maybe you have some sense after all, Haroon, the police officer in the driver's seat said. Friends like that are dangerous to keep. Your whole future could go down the tubes with friends like that. I run my hand along the armrest of the door, hoping they don't notice, hoping to find a secret button that will spring the door open. I'm sure your family is proud of you, says Detective Moffat. You're not getting mixed up with bombings, and you know that withholding information from the police about these things is just as bad as doing them yourself. Worse even, you know it's wrong. You're not all full of these crazy notions that are damaging the good name of your religion around the world. What is that saying? All it takes for evil to triumph is for men of good will to do nothing. They stare at me, hard. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to look away. Detective Moffat gives me his card. Call me about anything, day or night. Let's clear up this mess. I take the card. I don't have the guts to refuse it. I don't know anything, I say. And there's no way to say that without sounding guilty. A lot of people think they don't know anything. But then, when they really start to think about it, they realize they know more than they thought. Then they all start to ask questions, rapid fire, like Miss Singh during a drill, one right after the other. Do you think you might be one of those people? Do you think you might know something? And if you do, will you share what you know, or will you keep it to yourself? Will your parents continue to be proud of you, or will they be sitting on a cold, hard bench outside the courtroom, weeping and wondering what happened to their cute little boy? Will you help us, or will you help them? There's no middle ground. We are in a war. In a war, there are no innocent bystanders. A rabbi, a priest, and a policeman captain walk into a donut shop, says a voice. There's a knock on the window beside me. I turn my head, and there's the grinning puppet face of Reverend Bob, joined a second later by the grinning face of Julian. He makes Reverend Bob tap on the front window. Can Haroon come out and play? Amazingly, they let me go. They open my door, and I don't look back. Julian puts his arm around my shoulder and walks me through the jungle of the staring faces. He and Reverend Bob engage in wild conversation, giving me cover until we get through the school doors and go our separate ways to class.